Super to fuel a housing surge. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Let's have a look at this news.com.au article written by Tarek Brooker discussing the super withdrawals could see a Aussie housing market supercharge. Now, often I will advocate for people having control of their own money. On a fundamental basis, I don't agree with the, the government acting so paternalistic that they force people to save. I think people should learn through having control of their own money. And I resent the delays to, frankly, being able to buy a house myself while having all this money just sitting there in super that you couldn't touch. It's kind of frustrating. And I'm sure I'm not alone. Now, often many people will say you can't let people use their super to buy because it's going to just blow up the market. It's going to, it'll be an example of the candle on effect. You'll have it, uh, you know, money supply increasing and flooding into one sector. It'll bubble. And yeah, it's going to do exactly that. There's going to be calls for super, you know, we see them left, right and center to allow people to get in the housing and it will bubble the market. Guys, don't make, don't pretend it won't. But that's because it's all completely artificial and not natural. You know, the market has been, is being manipulated. All these people are being forced to uh, save money and then it's all being released at once. It, it's insane. This is what happens when the government steps in. Every time they try to do something good, it always comes back to bite them in the ass. You've now got generations of people who are struggling to get into housing, a fundamental basic thing that everyone wants to st establish a family, to have some stability. From every aspect to just, you know, children's grades to quality of life, having a stable home is really important. And that flows through your entire life. And now that it's, it's at a point where it's, it's virtually unattainable for a big chunk of our population here in Australia. So I, I can understand exactly why people are calling for this. I want people to have more control over it. What would you rather? Would you rather have a paid off house or a big chunk of super and renting when you're older? You know, I'll ask that as a community poll. We'll see how people respond. So let's have a look at, at Tarek's article here. So there are a few things in the world that can get Australians talking as much as property prices. Yeah, well, mate, <laughs> it's a national sport here in Australia. It bloody well is. Whether it's, it's talking negative gearing investment properties at a backyard barbecue or first home buyers discussing a potential purchase around the dinner, dinner table, property is never far from people's minds. I was talking to a, a couple, a generation older than, my, than me, probably two maybe. They got a property here in Brisbane, two blocks of land for 50 grand just in you know 87 and then they, they uh, told me how they were they got their house built quite smartly and they were paying cash for everything the bank just gave them a big chunk of money for the construction and they just did it all cash ease to get it cheaper and more cost effective you couldn't do that now could you guys you know all these little things all these interventions to make it easier to help people they all add up everyone they all add up so and since the pandemic began Avid watchers of Aussie real estate have certainly had a lot to talk about. But as the property market heats up for what some analysts are predicting will be a boom year, there is one factor playing a role in the ongoing price growth, which may have been overlooked, superannuation withdrawals. Yeah, we don't seem to to see it mentioned that much in a lot of these articles. You know, because, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, a couple each taking out 20 grand, that's 40 grand, boom, then you get the government bribes to buy housing you suddenly got a deposit. Oh, but the, the banks won't lend to you if you've, if you've taken out the super. You know, they won't care. They, you know, you, you just have it sitting there long enough, they'll ignore it. They'll want to get you in. <laughs> when the Morrison government first allowed people to withdraw up to 20 grand from their super annuation from April last year, it was ostensibly intended as a measure to help struggling households through the worst of the pandemic. During the roughly nine-month life of the program, around 3.5 million people withdrew a, a uh, cumulative 36 billion which is around about one percent of all of the supers holdings by the way it's not that much with around 500,000 all but emptying their accounts entirely now that's the thing there guys how can if all you have is 20 grand sitting there isn't it better isn't it better to be getting into a house 
So then you're, you're, I mean, okay, there's still going to be cost associated with it, even if the market crashes and you're in the, you know, you're in the, the red negative equity for a couple of years, maybe even a decade. You know, isn't it better to at least get in a house and have some stability? You can add value to it. You can live there. You can rent out the other rooms. You can have more freedom. But it shows you, you know, it's super working. How many people get on the super, get it all out, and then just piss it away? Or have to use it to pay off debts when they retire? And most people who took the super out, the majority of it went to people paying off debts. So here I am living in my fantasy world of people are becoming better with their finances. I really hope they are. Because sometimes you just need a, a good slap in the face to wake you up and to get stuff sorted. So... While the government's intention may have been for super withdrawals to provide a much needed boost to household budgets during the pandemic, it didn't really end up working out that way for many who made one or more withdrawals. According to figures from the analytics firm Alpha Beta, in the two weeks following a superannuation withdrawal, 64% of the additional spending was on non-essentials, including clothing, furniture, takeaway, alcohol, and gambling. But some shall we say, enterprising folks have used their super withdrawals for a very different purpose, a deposit for a house. I mean, that's the thing. I knew a lady who I, I knew from university, public servant. She'd lived in a property that was owned by her family super company, her family super fund. She lived in it rent-free, just had a roommate and did it all through there. So they were doing the dodge. All of these people, you know, do the dodge, guys. I think a lot of them don't realize how much they're doing it. According to figures from research firm DFA, 22% of first-term buyers who have purchased a property in the last six months did so with a deposit at least partially made up by withdrawals from their superannuation. A further half of those withdrew the maximum 20000 from their super over the course of the policy's two rounds. It is true the first-term buyer activity in the market was trending up before the pandemic hit, but since COVID-19 arrived, it had become a driving force supporting rising property prices. Can you blame people? Can you blame them for wanting a home? Can you blame them thinking, you know what, that's my money. I'm not going to get it till I'm, what, 65. By then, they'll probably put the age up to 75. Can you blame them? I'd rather, you know, there's one woman in the comments saying how her husband was gone by the time he, he would have been 65 to get it. All that money, all that hard work, nothing. Is it better in your hands now or in the future? Is it better you having control in it? Because I'm going to Rachel going, you know, we're... we're looking at planning investments after we do this construction. I mean, we should put it in our super to maximize the tax benefits. And she goes, yeah, I'd rather have the flexibility to access it. According to data from the ABS in December 2019, before the pandemic arrived, there were 9,719 first home buyer finance commitments. For December 2020, the number of first home buyers making finance commitments rocketed 56.4% to 15,205. This explosion in demand has seen the number of first-home buyer finance commitments rise to the highest level in over 11 years and very nearly the highest on record. Only the, the period dominated by the Rudd government's first-home buyer grants in 2019 showed a high level of activity. Yeah, I mean, this is going to bite us. This is going to screw us all, guys. It's just going to inflate the housing costs. That's what it does. It's the candle on effect. It happened with Rudd's first-home buyer grants. It's no different. Meanwhile, there are reports that some banks will not recognize super withdrawals as savings appropriate to be used for deposits for three months after the withdrawal was made. Yes, yeah, so you just wait three months. That's what people are going to do. With housing turnover still sitting near multi-decade lows, despite a recent uptick from a lockdown impact at low base, it's possible that the effect of these, these super withdrawals have driven deposits, sorry, withdrawals driven deposits have made, may have been further amplified. Recently, figures from housing price provider CoreLogic revealed that the amount of housing stock listed for sale was 28.3% below the five-year average and even lower than during the height of the pandemic last year. According to Martin North, the principal of research firm Digital Finance Analytics, the super withdrawals have had a significant impact on the property market. Quite a few first home buyers saw this as a silver bullet to get into the property market, so it has definitely driven the first home buyer market. Very significantly in Western Australia, very significantly in some parts of the urban fringes of Sydney and Melbourne, it has been a big factor. However, as you can see from the ABS graph below, this isn't the first time first home buyer market has been induced by external factor, factors towards record levels. When the Rudd government introduced its first homeowner grant in 2008 as part of its GFC response, demand similarly skyrocketed. 
In just five months, the number of first home buyers making a finance commitments to buy a home more than doubled. But like most booms in activity driven by temporary incentives, it was not to last. Less than 18 months later, the number of first home buyers making finance commitments was lower than when the grant started. But the question is, Martin, did the people who buy in using this, are they better off now than if not? Would it have taken longer if they had have waited, you know, maybe a few years to get the to get in the market? Would the entry price have been a lot higher? So the forward demand from first home buyers in my data is coming down because they don't have the same access to government incentives that they had previously and super withdrawals have come to an end, Mr. North said. But it may not be the end for very long. If a group of Liberal MPs led by Tim Wilson have their way, we may be seeing just the beginnings of a housing market supported by super withdrawals for first home buyers. But what we need to do is we need to end super. Mandatory superannuation needs to be phased out in this country. I think it's a nice little experiment that, uh, you know, Keating has his legacy on. I think we need to end it before he dies. It just needs to go. If, if this happens, if they start allowing people to use this for their... You know, their funding, it needs to be completely voluntary and it needs to end. Because otherwise, it's just going to become a honeypot that people call to again and again and again to, you know, prop up the market, prop up the economy, and we're just going to get candle on effect again and again and again. Housing this time, next time, next time, you know, shares, next time, I don't know, apple farms. This is the problem when the government steps in and regulates things. They stuff it up every time. There's going to be unintended consequences. You know, guys, we need them to step back. Okay? The invisible hand of the market isn't evil. It's neutral. Where government, well, it, it, there's more evidence historically of the government being evil than the free hand of the market. Under the proposed plans, first-term buyers being able to withdraw part of their super to use as part of a deposit for a home would become a permanent fixture. As it stands, the proposal is just that proposed legislation. It is yet to become government policy backed by the Coalition Party Room or Prime Minister Scott Morrison. However, a significant number of cross-bench senators have already voiced in principle support for it. Where first home buyer demand and property prices will head for remains uncertain, as Australia and the world continues to come to grips with the pandemic. But ultimately, if superannuation withdrawals become a normal part of a first home buyer's deposit, we may see history repeat as first home buyer demands rockets to record highs. And have you used your super to buy a house? There's the question. I'll put that to the community here and we'll have a look. So what do you think, guys? Do you think we're going to see super become a permanent way to enter into the housing market? Do you support it or do you not? Let us know in the comments down below. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel. Thank you all for watching. If you're a fan and enjoy the content I create here, there are a few ways you can support us. You can join the channel on YouTube or Patreon. You can support us using our affiliate links on Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve, or Aussie Broadband. You can buy a merch from Heiser Says, use Gold Pass from the Perth Mint, or support us via PayPal. Take care, everyone. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.